So the employers also that are registered with SARS, they get classified against these industry codes. So every single company gets put into these codes. Now if you run a company and you are not aware what your industry code is, you should probably check because it's quite important for a number of things and the type of support you can expect from various stakeholders, right? So you want to check that you're in the right one. Okay, now this is for next financial year. It's just been passed by our accounting authority, uh, not yet by parliament. Um, but these are the top 10 uh, SCAR skills. Um, program project manager, environmental engineer, water quality analyst, energy, civil, electrical, electricians as well as concentrated, which I think will form very much part of the OFO code um, review project and something that I think we have to highlight because the sector went through quite a big effort to change it and now it's <coughs> back to where it was two years ago, you know. Um, that's the SCAR skills list. So the SCAR skills list is basically the summary of this entire SSP, which we have to put down to now 10 priority list skills, right? As you can imagine, this is a fairly difficult exercise. On top of that, we are extremely bound by, by the occupation codes, right? By the um, organizing framework of occupations. We can only put in our SCAR skills list what is listed as an OFO, which is why the project that the Department of Water and Sanitation is leading will be absolutely crucial. Because a lot of the jobs that people do are not currently listed as an occupation, therefore, we cannot even support it. Right? So maybe just to highlight also why some of these titles seem a little bit weird or people don't really know where to put themselves on this OFO code, right? Or in our sector skills plan even. Which is also why I'm going to be perfectly honest, a lot of the research that gets put up by universities around SCAR skills for us is essentially relatively useless. Because if you tell us you require you know, a certain occupation, if it's not listed, you can't even link it. Most universities are not even aware of the OFO list. We really cannot include it, right? And I had a very long conversation with um, Shanna, who's going to present later on the WSC or the DST roadmap. They have these wonderful future skills list. How we cannot support it if it's not linked, right? And it must be said that the WSC has risen to the occasion and actually sent us quite a comprehensive feedback on our SSP, including links to the OFO code. So partnerships are happening, <laughs> and I think awareness is really required, which is why I went through who funds what. How do we actually link, right? If we, if we have to speak to each other, I think a lot more. It has been my experience since I've taken on this job. Um, because there's a lot of frustration in the sector, but a lot of misunderstanding of how it actually works, right? Um, okay, now I just quickly also, because another big understanding is how EWC to actually work. We do not train ourselves, right, first of all. The reason also we don't meet a lot of our targets, I'm gonna talk a lot, just now my last slide, is because we also do not, we are not like NSFAS, well, they also work through universities, but we do not work with learners and students directly. Right? What happens is we get the skills levy, we have the grants, especially a discretionary grant. We then put out tenders, right? So we say, you saw in the previous slide, let me just maybe show you, you know, we need 3,000 um, concentrated solar power plant process controllers, right? So we put out um, a call for 3,000, right? We open up what we call our funding windows. Then basically what happens is that skills development providers, employers, NGOs, CBOs can come and basically apply. Now I can tell you right now, normally we get about triple the amount of applications than we have funding, which is great. Um, but we then allocate, well we basically means the management does recommendation and the accounting authority, the board approves it. Um, so there is, I'm not gonna lie, quite a lot of politics around it, which I have absolutely no influence over. Now, that, what then happens is that those guys, they then deal with the learner students or their own employees, depending on who applied um, and depending on what the setup is. So these projects often have a lot of different partners, right? So let's say an NGO applies, 
They then need the municipality for the buy-in, they need a skills development provider to actually provide the training. So there are a lot of partners and a lot of things that can go wrong. Now I'm going to be honest, we have not been that great with monitoring and evaluation. It's definitely been one of our challenges in terms of implementation and we're tightening it up quite a lot now. Um, but so a lot of times when you hear in the media, for example, that the CETAs have these vast amount of unused money, it's because a lot of times these guys here with whom we work, with, through whom we distribute the money, are not actually doing what they set out in the contract. So we get, for example, just to give you a scary statistic, we just opened a funding window. 30% of the people that applied for the funding are coming back to us with change requests. Now, a change request <laughs> is kind of a major thing because we signed an SLA with the Department of Higher Education and Training to say who we would train based on our skills plan, right? Based on this document. Now, if you come back to us and say, oh, but actually I've only found 10 people that want to do solar and now I have another 10 that really want to do engineering. You're basically throwing our entire yearly plan into the water and we in a way have to start from scratch once we get 30%. Because ultimately we have the choice of taking the money away from you, right, allocating it to somebody else, reopening a funding window or seeing whether we can kind of make it work. Okay. Now, ultimately, if you apply for a fund for a CETA, I would seriously recommend you know exactly that you can implement it. Because we are at the stage because we are under so much pressure to perform that we take funding away now. We are quite harsh, change requests, we are not big fans putting it out there. If anyone is here put in a change request, they also know it takes about nine months to go through our processes. And one of the reasons being that, you know, we have made the plan this year for next year and that's kind of what we said we would do and that's what also the Auditor General looks at when they look at us. Um, apart from some of the challenges that I already mentioned, um, I wanted to answer to the, the extent, right? What are the challenges of the extent of support we can give? Um, there are more challenges than this, but I try to keep it. For us, a major one in terms of actually so effectively supporting the water sector. And maybe I should have actually put one that says a lack of understanding of the system and who does what. But also a lack of sector representative data. That means, for example, the WSPs we get. I mean, I think it's something like 15% of the...